Hey everybody, Jordan here from the Minnesota Discovery Center. Welcome back to the 10th annual, second virtual Iron Range Science and Engineering Festival. This year, we're proud to be presenting to more than 1,350 Northland students from more than 13 schools across Northern Minnesota. But before we get started with these exciting presentations, we'd like to thank these sponsors. This virtual experience was a partnership presentation brought to you by the Carnegie Museum of Natural History and the Hill Annex Paleontology Project. Today we're going to be looking at what kind of animals and dinosaurs were roaming around northern Minnesota more than 90 million years ago. Let's get started. Hi, I'm Dr. Matt Lamana, Associate Curator of Vertebrate Paleontology here at Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. I'm really happy to be presenting at the Iron Range Science and Engineering Festival. The Cretaceous period was the third and final time period of the Mesozoic era, commonly known as the Age of Dinosaurs. It extended from 145 to 66 million years ago, a span of 79 million years. The continent of North America, on which I'm standing, was home to a diverse array of dinosaurs throughout the entire Cretaceous. However, around 100 million years ago, at the dawn of an epoch, or subdivision of the Cretaceous known as the Late Cretaceous, warm global temperatures and correspondingly high sea levels led to the flooding of the North American Midwest by a shallow sea called the Western Interior Seaway. The Western Interior Seaway was home to a diversity of marine creatures, including those shown here, shelled squid-like animals called ammonites, numerous fish species, predatory aquatic reptiles such as plesiosaurs and mosasaurs, sea turtles, diving birds, and more, all of which are known from fossils found in areas that today are dry land, such as Kansas, South Dakota, and the Canadian province of Manitoba. But despite the fact that it was a marine habitat and non-avian, aka non-bird, since birds are, evolutionarily speaking, a kind of dinosaur, Dinosaurs were almost exclusively land-living animals, the Western Interior Seaway had a profound effect on the evolution of dinosaurs too. At its greatest extent, around 90 million years ago, the seaway was several hundred miles wide and stretched from what's now Alaska to what's now the Gulf of Mexico. In so doing, it divided North America into two gigantic islands, Laramidia in the west and Appalachia in the east. The late Cretaceous dinosaurs of the western landmass of Laramidia are among the world's best known and include such famous species as Triceratops, Anzu, Pachycephalosaurus, and of course, T-Rex. Their counterparts from Appalachia, on the other hand, the dinosaurs that lived at the end of the age of dinosaurs in places such as Pennsylvania, Minnesota, and pretty much everywhere else east of the North American Great Plains, mostly remain a mystery due to a scarcity of well-preserved fossils. Why is this a big deal, you might ask? Wouldn't the late Cretaceous dinosaurs that lived in Western North America, Laramidia, just have lived in Eastern North America, Appalachia, too? Well, the answer is probably not, and this has to do with the effects that huge bodies of water, such as oceans and seas, typically have on the evolution of non-flying land animals like dinosaurs. For most of these animals, oceans and seas represent barriers that can almost never be crossed. This leads to the isolation of populations of animals on either side of the sea. Over millions of years, this, in turn, can lead to the evolution of very different kinds of animals in these separated areas. Think, for instance, of modern-day Australia, which is home to pouched mammals found nowhere else, such as kangaroos, koalas, and Tasmanian devils. This is mainly because Australia has been an island continent surrounded by oceans for most of the past 60 million years. As such, we paleontologists think that the dinosaurs of the lost landmass of Appalachia may have been pretty different from the much better known species that were living at the same time in Laramidia. Trouble is, due to the rarity of fossil bearing rocks of the right type and geological age here in Eastern North America, we don't have many fossils to tell us one way or the other. Generally speaking, the better preserved fossils we paleontologists have of a given prehistoric animal, the more we can learn about it. So the near total lack of well-preserved dinosaur fossils from Appalachia means that our understanding of most of these creatures is still very poor. However, the limited fossil evidence we do have suggests that Appalachian dinosaurs were indeed their own thing 
relative to their Laramidian cousins. So, what kinds of dinosaurs lived in Appalachia during the late Cretaceous? Well, the Appalachian dinosaurs that we know the most about are hadrosauromorphs, or duck-billed dinosaurs. Hadrosauromorphs such as Protohadros, Parasaurus, Lophorothon, Eotrachodon, Hypsibema, and Hadrosaurus have been found in Appalachia, and several are known from reasonably complete skeletons. Although related to dinosaurs from the same time in Laramidia and elsewhere, these Appalachian hadrosauromorphs appear to have been unique to this particular subcontinent. Interestingly, many of them, even those from the very end of the Cretaceous, seem evolutionarily primitive compared to Laramidian duckbills. This suggests that Appalachia may have acted as a sort of refuge for relatively archaic hadrosauromorphs millions of years after these kinds of dinosaurs had become extinct in Laramidia. As a fun aside, the original fossil of Hadrosaurus, dug up in 1858 in Haddonfield, New Jersey, was the first partial dinosaur skeleton to be found in the Western Hemisphere. Also, although known only from very incomplete fossils, Hypsobema seems to have been one of the largest hadrosauromorphs yet discovered, with adults probably measuring between 40 and 50 feet in length. Several other varieties of plant-eating dinosaurs are known from Appalachia as well, though all are represented by very incomplete fossils. These include nodosaurids, or tank-like armored dinosaurs, and at least one leptoceratopsid, a small, hornless distant relative of the much more famous horned dinosaurs, such as Triceratops. Theropods, or bipedal, generally predatory, and often feathered dinosaurs, are known from Appalachia as well. The best-known Appalachian theropods are Appalachiosaurus and Dryptosaurus, both of which were Tyrannosauroids, smaller, distant cousins of T. rex. Both are known from partial skeletons, studies of which have shed some light on their evolutionary relationships. Interestingly, although Dryptosaurus lived at approximately the same time as T. rex, at the very end of the Cretaceous, it represents a very different, more primitive kind of Tyrannosauroid. Along with the evidence from hadrosauromorphs, this shows that many Appalachian dinosaurs differed substantially from those of Laramidia, and supports the hypothesis that Appalachia may have served as a refuge for dinosaurs that have become extinct elsewhere. Other Appalachian theropods include ornithomimosaurs, or ostrich dinosaurs, and dromaeosaurids, relatives of Velociraptor of Jurassic Park fame. Judging from the size of their teeth, some Appalachian dromaeosaurids may have been large for this group, perhaps over 10 feet long. A final fossil discovery suggests that the reign of many of Appalachia's native dinosaurs may have ended prior to the end of the Cretaceous. Near the end of this period, the Western Interior Seaway began to retreat, and much of the American Midwest again became dry land, reuniting Laramidia and Appalachia. This may have allowed the once unique dinosaurs of the two areas to mix. Evidence of this comes in the form of the tooth of a distinctly Laramidian type of dinosaur, a ceratopsid or horned dinosaur akin to Triceratops from the latest Cretaceous of Mississippi. Perhaps horned dinosaurs migrated to what was once Appalachia following the reunification of this landmass with Laramidia. Shortly thereafter, the saga of Appalachian dinosaurs, and indeed all non-avian dinosaurs, would come to a cataclysmic end when a gigantic meteor fell from the sky and wreaked havoc all around the world. So, clearly, what we paleontologists know of Appalachia's dinosaurs shows that they were super interesting. Unfortunately, however, because Appalachian dinosaur fossils are relatively scarce, there's so much more still to learn. That's where the Hill Annex Paleontology Project at the Minnesota Discovery Center comes in. Here, at Hill Annex Mines State Park in Calumet, Minnesota, paleontologists are collecting fossils from a roughly 90 million year old rock unit called the Coleraine Formation. Although just a couple dinosaur bones have been found from these rocks thus far, they're important in providing a unique and precious window on the dinosaurs that lived on Appalachia's northwest coast during the early stages of the late Cretaceous, when the Western Interior Seaway was at its widest. Thanks, Matt. I'm John, and I'm here at Hill Annex Mine State Park in Calumet, Minnesota. You're with me here on what we call the public pile. And this is a stockpile of Cretaceous age soil, roughly 90 million years old. And this is where the public comes. If you come here for a tour, we'll help you find your own Cretaceous age fossil. 
this is was a near shore environment so uh, to my right off to the west it used to be a uh, the Western Interior Sea. So the ocean actually flooded the center part of North America. Um, and this would have been the extreme west coast of Appalachia, uh, the, the, the subcontinent of North America at that time, um, forming mostly the, the eastern part of the United States. Um, and that ocean would have gradually risen. Uh, sea levels at that time were more than 1,200 feet higher than they are today. And as the ocean rose, it would have gradually encroached on Minnesota from the west, uh, covering the Dakotas and covering the western part of the state and actually reaching all the way here uh, to the Mesabi Iron Range um, here at Hill Annex Mine State Park in Calumet. But most of the fossils that we're finding here are, uh, like I said, a near shore environment. So uh, snails, clams, oysters, mussels, um, we find, uh, I just found a shark tooth just a minute or two ago. Uh, we'll find some fish teeth, occasionally some turtle or crocodile parts. Um, and always looking for new things. Each year that we've been out here uh, for seven years now, um, we found something new that hasn't been documented previously. Uh, even if it's just something really small, um, it can be new to the, to the annals of science. Um, I've already dropped uh, roughly 80 flags um, in an hour, hour and a half this morning. Um, and just to give us a visual of how much, uh, how many fossils, how, uh, how rich this, this deposit was, um, and to help uh, give people a visualization that it's really not that hard to find a fossil. Um, they're here all over the hill, uh, just about everywhere that you go. It's just a little, little section of ammonite. Uh, this is uh, a mollusk and it would have a coiled shell with an animal like a squid or an octopus that lived in it. So there's Cretaceous deposits underneath about 60% of the state. Um, but the problem is, is they're buried underneath a significant amount of sand and gravel from the glaciers. Um, so something like an open pit iron mine can expose that. Um, and we uh, started doing some more, more checking. Uh, th this one hadrosaur bone um, was, was at this point the only dinosaur bone that we had known of in the state. Um, then in 2013 and early 14, um, me and my research partner, Doug Hanks, uh, began following up on some work that was being done by the paleontologist at the Science Museum at the time, uh, Bruce Erickson. And one of the things we were doing was checking a number of Cretaceous age sites around Minnesota or nearby. Um, and early that summer, we came here to Hill Annex. Uh, and it was the first time I had been here, but immediately that first summer, um, we started finding some things that we couldn't find in the documented literature for what's known about what lived here. Um, and actually every year uh, for this last seven years um, since we started this work, we found something new. Uh, one of my volunteers, Len Janusz, uh, came back to the vehicles near the end of the day, um, really excited. Uh, he thought he had found something and it was, it, it, he said, it, it's it's got to be the biggest tooth that I've ever found. Um, and he pulled it out and, and, and it, it, it was big for a tooth, uh, you know, two some inches long, about an inch tall. Um, but the, the shape, the, the curvature is more of a sickle shape, uh, didn't really match with the tooth. Um, so we, uh, we burst his bubble and let him know that, you know, the, sorry, Len, this isn't a tooth. Um, but what it is, uh, and, and very distinctly um, with this shape, was uh, the, the toe or finger bone from a theropod dinosaur. Um, so right there in 2015, we had actually found just the second uh, dinosaur bone ever um, in Minnesota. We were certain that it's narrowed down to a dromaeosaurid or in that dromaeosaurid family. Um, so it's, it's also a, the second type of dinosaur um, besides the hadrosaur and, and found right here 
in, in Calumet, Minnesota. Um, and then in 2017, uh, we found a vertebrae uh, about the size of a golf ball. And we're still working on that, but we're very certain it is reptilian and 90% uh, certain it is not crocodilian. So that is very likely just the third dinosaur bone. Um, and we're hoping for four or five this year. Hey everyone, thanks for coming out and visiting with us today. We're always happy to be part of the Iron Range Science and Engineering Festival. Keep an eye on us on the Minnesota Discovery Center website. And maybe one of these summers, you can come out with Hill Annex Paleontology Project and we'll help you find one of your own 90 million year old fossils.